introduce myself. I'm Gary Montero. I'm one of the uh, attendings at Methodist. Um, they'll let up my slides. I'm going to talk about adult congenital heart disease. Um, I, I have one disclosure. I, I lecture for Gatinga on opcaps. Um, and this is sort of like congenital heart disease. The patients come in, they say they're doing great. But if you actually test them, they're not versus their peer group. They just have lived their entire lives like that, so they don't know that their exercise tolerance is low or that they shouldn't be short of breath. It's just how they live their lives. Um, yeah, this is a slide I put in last night after the after after party. Um, so it might have some of the spellings. Uh, this, this week, these are just the consults that I got from an anesthesia side. We have a 30 weeker uh, pregnancy, first child from uh, yeah, East Texas with uh, severe tissue valve AS. Um, she's 19 years old. Uh, VSD, which is, and then we have a coming to the, you know, uh, Methodist for the adult side, a 22-year-old, uh, barely verbal Downs, former Ted A.V. Canal that he's a pulmonic valve now because they did a transannular patch. This was a case I did on Thursday when I was just covering cardio versions because I was early and I was supposed to go home. Dave is one of our EP guys, and this is a text message from one of our CRNAs. So if you can read that, the next. TE is here. Okay, great. Would knock that out and I'll go home for lunch. 35-year-old male with detransposition of the great vessel status post-atrial switch with systemic ventricle RV severely depressed um, with a fixed LV obstruction on, with, with SAM. So you will see these patients. They're, they're out there. They're living. They all used to die. Now they live. So you'll see them in their 30s and 50s now. Um, I'm going to start off with just some embryology because I didn't put any TEs in my lecture. This is a fish heart. Um, it's not super exciting until we start to see the evolution of uh, cardiac structures. Um, but you can see there's a single ventricle, there's an atrium, there's the gill capillaries, systemic capillaries, mixing of blood. Awesome. Two chamber heart. Now, once we evolve into amphibians, whether you, it all depends on if you believe in evolution or not, and that's a different lecture. Um, amphibian hearts, we start to see two separate atriums, and we start to see separation of uh, systemic capillaries or systemic uh, circulation and a pulmonary circulation. Um, this is when it gets exciting, reptiles. So when we, not we, but when life evolved into reptiles, one of the things you see is that you start to septate your ventricle. So this is the first time that we start to see uh, two separate ventricle systems, one going to the systemic, one going to the gas exchange system. And you can see in almost all of these, or in all of them, there's some sort of VSD structure. So in the lizard, it's right there in the ventricle. And you can see down there in the crocodile, you sort of see what would look like an aortopulmonary window in a uh, human being. Um, and then finally, we, we, you know, we get to what we're all used to seeing here with a completely septated ventricle, completely septated atria. OK, so how often is congenital heart disease occurring? depends on which numbers you look at, but about 0.8% of newborns. Most common lesions that you're going to see, VSDs, very, very common. Um, multiple times a year, somebody that we work with, uh, nurse, perfusionist, or somebody has a baby. It happens all the time. And then there's a murmur in the baby. And it's usually a muscular VSD, and we're going to see if it closes over time. But it causes a tremendous amount of stress for new parents, right? Is this going to close? Is my kid going to grow? But it's most common lesion, ASD, PDAs, pulmonic stenosis uh, along the spectrum of pulmonic atresia, coarctation, and then finally tetralogy of Fallot, which we're seeing a lot of patients now that 30 years ago had tetralogy of Fallot. They're living to be adults. They're 30, 50 years old. They never had a pulmonic valve. Now they need uh, medical care. So 85% so of newborns that are born now with congenital heart disease are going to reach adulthood. Depending on your hospital system, that means you're going to be taking care of them. Because when I was a fellow at Texas Children's, we'd have neonate, neonate, six-year-old, 45-year-old man in the ICU, you know, eating chicken strips and Gatorade. So the medical paradigm is shifting because these patients are surviving, and there's, a, there's literally a flood of them coming. Um, and most of them want to be taken care of in an adult hospital. Um, so about 40,000 births a year in the U.S. Almost in 2000, now if we had the recent numbers, over a million adults are alive in the U.S. that have congenital heart disease. Um, to two million adults. And the other thing to take home is it's not just patients that had BSDs or ASDs that are leave, living. 
we have single ventricle patients in their 30s. We have, we have pregnant patients coming in that have single ventricles, which is, uh, when I was a CA1 resident, I had a single ventricle patient on OB, um, and she survived that pregnancy. And I went home, and my dad's a uh, retired anesthesiologist now, and I said, man, we have this girl, she's pregnant, she's got a single ventricle, this is crazy. I wanna be an OB anesthesiologist. And my dad said, you don't wanna be an OB anesthesiologist, you wanna be a cardiac anesthesiologist. And that's sort of what led me down this path. Um, how often? There are actually more adults alive in the United States with congenital heart disease than children now. So congenital heart disease, numbers-wise, is an issue of the adult population. Okay, so who's gonna take care of this population? Cardiology, there's a defined adult congenital heart disease fellowship, ACGME. We actually have a cardiologist that I work with. You know, we're good friends and we work together on this program. Surgery, you'll do a CV surgery fellowship, then they'll do pediatric surgery, uh, pediatric CV surgery fellowships, and then a certain number of those guys will end up back in the adult world. And we're lucky enough that uh, McGilvery did that. So we have an adult congenital cardiologist, we have an adult congenital surgeon. Anesthesia, not really a whole lot going on there. We have CT fellowships, we have PD fellowships, we have pediatric CV fellowships that you can do after your PD fellowship or your CT fellowship. Um, I was sort of at the cusp of this, so I did an adult CT fellowship at a place that did a lot of adult congenital, and then went and did a PDCV fellowship. Um, if you guys have an interest in this stuff, you should think ahead into the practice setting you want. If you want to work at a pediatric hospital, you're probably going to need to do some training pathways through the pediatric system just for connections, familiarity with those guys, because PDCV um, and adult CV, you know, sometimes depending on the system, are separate entities. In some places, they're intertwined. Um, a couple years ago, I was going over some of this stuff with our fellows, and it, the stuff's on boards, it's on echo boards. Um, and they say, how am I supposed to study for this one? I've never even seen some of this. So we're gonna see some of it today. There are some guidelines, the ACC, AHA, 2008, 150 pages, guidelines. And there's half a page that mentions anesthesia. Um, so we stratified this document and for the most thought process, simple, moderate, and great complexity, congenital heart disease. What does that mean? Small slides, but simple stuff is, you know, non-symptomatic, congenital, bicuspid, you know, AS. Um, a small PDA, a small VSD. You know, we have stuff, we plug their ASD. So these are simple patients, and uh, the recommendation is that they can generally be cared for in the uh, normal, general medical population. We have moderate stuff, you know, uh, tetralogy of Fallot, VSDs with some valvular disease, Epstein's considered uh, moderate, coartation of the aorta, which you will see in the uh, adult population, because coarts we see as babies, and then we see when they're uh, getting their sports physicals is the other time we pick them up. Just like a uh, pectus, you'll see them when they're <laughs> really little, or you'll see them when they're in the locker room and they're uncomfortable because of the chest uh, deformation. That's when you, they start coming to the operating room. Severe patients with con uh, cyanotic heart disease, single ventricles, um, weird uh, rotational syndromes, heterotaxy syndromes, and uh, the recommendation is those patients should be seen in uh, adult congenital heart disease places. And these are actually the recommendations for what a regional congenital heart disease place looks like. You need to have a cardiologist, you need to have a surgeon. And then they say cardiologist, uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, several, available 24 seven. Your imaging modalities need to have people that can read congenital MRIs, congenital echo. With that guy for that TE cardioversion yesterday, the CRNA and I sat there, the first year echo fellow put the probe in and then just stared at it and was like, what is going on here? because uh, they weren't familiar with the patient's history. You know, so the RV was, there was atrial baffles and it was a lot of fun, so. Um, anesthesia recs, surgical procedures that require general anesthesia or conscious sedation, whatever that is, with moderate or complex congenital heart disease should be done at regional centers with anesthesiologists that are familiar with uh, ACD, uh, ACHD patients. Um, so cyanotic patients, this, this happens like once a month. Some cyanotic patient rolls into one of the peripheral hospitals or into the ambulatory surgery center, and everyone just freaks out. Um, 
we had an Eisenmenger's patient uh, in our system roll into one of the uh, like community ERs. They put a pulse, patient had shortness of breath, put a pulse ox on, they were 80. They decided to intubate the patient for airway protection and they were dead before the tube went in. So they got two milligrams per kilo of propofol and rocuronium and just straight arrested. So these patients are all out there in the community is the other thing. Same uh, slide, or same concept, uh, this is uh, from the guidelines, just saying you have high-risk patients there, and they're the people you would conceptually think are high-risk for uh, non-cardiac surgery, pulmonary hypertension, um, cyanotic patients, heart failure patients. Um, you know, in the congenital literature, we talk about systemic and non-systemic ventricles because sometimes left and right aren't left and right. Um, Moderate-risk patients. So... So people have actually looked at this in the anesthesia literature a tiny bit, um, comparing patients that have adult congenital heart disease to patients that don't. And this was a huge study. It was retrospective, but whatever. 10,000 patients, um, comparing them to a cohort of patients that having the same surgery that don't have adult congenital heart disease. And as you would guess, the patients that have a history of adult congenital heart disease have increased perioperative morbidity and mortality. Um, this slide is from that paper, and it's just showing that for non-cardiac surgery admissions, the adult congenital population is increasing as a relative percentage of that. But this is, this is the bread and butter slide here. So on y'all's left, ACHD cohort versus the comparison cohort, in every single category except death, the congenital patients stay in the hospital longer for the same surgery. They cost twice as much to take care of. Uh, acute renal failure, pneumonia, stroke. So they have a higher comorbidities associated with, or higher morbidity and mortality associated, not mortality, but morbidities associated with surgery versus somebody that didn't have a ASD when they were a kid. And this is because adult congenital heart disease is a systemic disease, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and then that another paper said there's no formal guidelines. Um, but it's widely accepted that cardiologists, anesthesiologists that are comfortable with these patients should take care of the sick, these sick patients. But we should always remember that ACHD is a systemic disease. Just because somebody has fixed plumbing, um, especially if they've had multiple surgeries, they're gonna have higher incidence of other diseases of other symptoms. And the most important one that you're gonna be uncomfortable with as adult anesthesiologists is PTSD. So if somebody had five surgeries as a child, and this happens to me all the time. I walk over there, I say hello, I have my little IV start kit, I put it down on the little table, and they start crying, right? And this is surprisingly common in the adult congenital population. Just a roll of tape will set somebody off. The anesthesia mask. So it, it's actually really sad. So we uh, always try to meet them preoperatively and talk about that stuff. But I, I've actually done inhalation inductions on a lot of these adult patients, because they, they can't even have their blood drawn without like freaking out and getting up and walking out. So um, improvements, you need team-based approaches to this as we develop systems for it. Surgeon, primary care, cardiologist, anesthesia, need to talk. So when I get consulted on a patient or we have a congenital patient, I want to know what their history is. Seems like a no-brainer, except most of these patients were operated on somewhere else, or they all were operated somewhere else, especially if you're in the adult world. And they may actually have surgical reports. In Houston, we're, we have a history because of uh, Texas Children's of taking care of a lot of these patients. And the surgical reports from the 60s and 70s are excellent. We can, they're all handwritten and we can get them. But you also have patients coming in who have absolutely nothing. They don't know what surgery they had. They don't know where it was. They don't know who did it. Their parents are dead. So there's just, there's nothing. Um, we don't know about their residual de uh, defects and uh, their imaging. A lot of these patients were operated on, told they were cool, like these tetralogy patients that don't have pulmonic valves. A lot of them thought they got fixed and they haven't seen a cardiologist in 25 years. So they're lost to follow up. Um, as consultant anesthesiologists, even if I'm not doing their case, if I just ca get called for it from the general side, I'll try to hook them up into the, with a cardiologist. So I'll give them the business card of the adult congenital cardiologist or tell them they really should see somebody. Um, a lot of them have devices because they have rhythm defects. Optimization, a lot of these patients will tell you that they're great. They do fine. Oh yeah, I keep up with my boys, we play ball. 
But if you exercise test them, they're not at their peer group level, but they don't know the difference because they've lived their whole life um, keeping up, but they don't know what normal is. Functional capacity, they're gonna tell you they're fine. Some of them are. If you actually test them, it's low. And I sort of mentioned anxiety, PTSD, um, and you know this is one of those weird situations where you might take a uh, adult do an inhalation induction. Rhythm disturbances is, are exceptionally common in the uh, adult congenital population. Couple mechanisms for this: one, they may have some sort of shunt, which a VSD, for example, which would pressure overload the right ventricle, pulmonary hypertension, dilation of a chamber increased work, you get ventricular remodeling, you get fibrosis, rhythm disturbance, volume overload. Um, same thing, let's uh, talk about the tetralogy patients. One of the things we follow in tetralogy of fellow patients as they become adults is the volume of their right ventricle when we're deciding whether or not to uh, repair them yet. Atrial enlargement's really common. I'll show you some scar patterns that we do, but a lot of these kids had atrial incisions, scar tissue, especially the ventricle. When I'm doing non-cardiac surgery in congenital patients, one of the questions people ask or the consults are, do I need to place defibrillator pads on the patient? The answer is always yes. Um, if you think about placing pads on a patient, place them. Because there's nothing worse than trying to take the drapes off and shock somebody. Um, and it's not just for ventricular arrhythmias. There are certain congenital lesions that don't tolerate SVT, for example, single ventricles like P waves. Um, so you also want to find out what was done. A lot of the nomenclature of congenital is, that's a lot of the hard part is figuring out the language because different places use different systems. So when you hear somebody was palliated, and we've all heard that, we've all had a palliated patient. What that means is that they had a shunt, they had a Norward procedure, they had a PA banding, they had a Fontan, but palliation is done to establish or restrict blood flow to the body or the lungs. It doesn't give you a normal four-chamber heart and a normal flow pattern. What it's doing is allowing the child to grow. And a lot of these kids get palliated and then stop going to see the doctor. So they will show up at some weird stage with some weird shunt. So we want to find out what's going on. When you hear a congenital patient was corrected, it typically means that their plumbing is normal. Um, truncus, an interruption with a sw uh, truncus, PDA, um, a transposition that had a you know, a, switch, a great vessel switch. So let's just talk about shunts while we go into lunch here for the next five minutes. So these are not done anymore. This is not something that you will ever see. About five times a year we have an adult that rolls in with one of these. So central shunts, and you can see the, the function of these shunts is to provide blood flow to the pulmonary artery, right? So let's say the patient just has a completely closed off or pulmonic atresia, there's no blood flow going to their lungs. So you can see a central shunt would provide blood from the aorta to the PA. Watterson shunt, Potts shunt, these are all called central shunts. Um, but you don't see them anymore, except in patients that were lost to follow up. What you'll see now are uh, BT shunts. Um, the classic is on the right, which you won't see anymore because we don't do them anymore except when your patients come in with them and your resident's trying to put in a right radial arterial line and they don't have a subclavian artery. Happens a couple of times a year to me. What we do now is what's called MBTS, which is a modified uh, BT shunt. It shouldn't be red, it should be white because that's a graft. And what we're doing is we're dropping down a graft from the subclavian to the PA and you can see blood flow is gonna come out of the aorta and we're gonna provide increased blood flow to the pulmonary circuit. So shunts, again, the goal is to provide supplemental, is to supplement or provide pulmonary blood flow. Conceptually, you wanna think about the SVR versus the PVR difference as it relates to the pressure difference. So you're gonna have more blood going to the lungs or, or to the pulmonary circuit if the PVR is low, if there's the pressure difference is greater. Um, but in shunted patients, especially as adults, you have to have that concept of balance. So you can have really awesome SATs on a, a shunted patient, and they have great pulmonary blood flow, but that's at the expense of blood going to their body. So their SATs are 100, they're getting uh, progressively high lactates, 
because too much of that cardiac output, which is shared, is going through the lungs. And you can have the opposite, where too much blood's going through their body, and then you have low sats. Cavopulmonary shunts, um, bidirectional glens, um, and I'm sure you guys have had patients with these. The anatomy is what's important, hearing the words. Um, in a bidirectional glen, we're gonna take the SVC, and we're gonna hook it up to the pulmonary artery. So this is of note because when you try to drop a PA catheter in this patient, or when you put your central line in, it's a PA catheter. But it's not gonna be pulsatile. Um, so we always wanna know the anatomy. And when you guys are reviewing this stuff later, the goal of the cable pulmonary shunt is to reduce the blood flow returning to that single chamber so you reduce the amount of volume the heart's seeing. Not, not important right now, but it'll be there for when you so, and then the final step in a single ventricle pathway or is a Fontan. And then we've all heard the term. Some of us have taken care of these patients. There's lots of versions of them. So these are sort of the main variations of these over time. Original, we don't do anymore, but you may see a patient that has one. Atrial pulmonary, where, you know, these are all techniques that aren't used anymore, but it's just what the terminology means. What you'll see now, the most common is an extra cardiac Fontan, where the IVC comes up into a graft, goes up to the PA, and we've already done our bidirectional glen here. So all of our systemic blood coming back to the heart's gonna come and then go down the lungs, come back to the heart, go out the aorta. On y'all's left is a lateral tunnel Fontan, which was sort of hot. Um, and when you talk about Fontan conversion surgery, which you, you guys may um, be involved in, we're talking about converting one of the historic models of Fontans to the modern version of the Fontan. That's what a Fontan conversion surgery is. Let's see. Okay, just the same, same picture. So this is your final pathway of a single ventricle Fontan. Um, you, know, you have your Fontan, you had your Norwood procedure for hypoplastic left heart there. So in conclusion, because everyone's hungry, huge growing patient population. If you get excited about this stuff, and you want to pursue it, you'll be sought after. I'm just, people are just all over me about this stuff, so. Um, but if you like it, pursue it. it. It's an awesome patient population. It combines some of pediatric anesthesia, a lot of CV anesthesia. The echoes are awesome. Um, learn the anatomy, and the key to learning the anatomy in each individual patient is to draw it. So when I do these complex congenital patients, I draw out the, pre-anatomy and what we're aiming for in the post-anatomy, and I have it on the anesthesia machine. Because that allows me to understand our monitoring better. Um, the anatomy defines the physiology. Um, so they all have some systemic disease. Phone a friend, congenital is complicated, so call your cardiologist, call your pediatric colleagues. You guys all have somebody that you were friends with in residency who's now a pediatric fellow. And uh, collaborate with them, because it's awesome. It's a team sport. Surgery, anesthesia, cardiology, uh, OB, uh, perfusion, maternal fetal medicine. So it allows you to have a subspecialty in cardiac anesthesia that also allows you to interact with other departments. And that's, that's great if you guys like that. Um, and now we're going to go hit lunch.